Good morning, everybody. <coughs> Welcome. The title I have today is Winning Without Fighting. These are lessons from the Vietnam War. <coughs> it's a, um, a new thread from a talk I gave uh, last fall at the Eldridge Library. <coughs> that talk uh, was entitled Vietnam, Any Other Road to Take. The idea there was that we had choices, but we still wound up losing the war even while American troops acquitted themselves valiantly. valiantly. Tactically, we were good. Strategically, we suffered. With respect to Memorial Day, this applies to all wars. In any case, the Vietnam War is a very good example of how we could have done better. <clears throat> Today, I hope to convey the idea that has, uh, has currency in our time. The idea is to win without fighting, often attributed to Sun Tzu, a Chinese general who lived over 2,500 years ago. My two novels on Vietnam, which are based on my experience as, and much research, portray uh, GIs struggling to find the truth about what they were doing amidst the confusion, lies, and misguided strategy of the war. <clears throat> the characters are trying to make sense of why they are there with little information that was available to them. <clears throat> they knew something of Sun Tzu, but they didn't have a full picture that would give a better understanding of their situation. Indeed, <clears throat> the Pentagon Papers emerged only in June 1971, while the characters were in the midst of combat and still unsettled in their understanding of the war. <clears throat> it took many years after that for a better evaluation of the war <clears throat> and now we can see things a little bit more clearly and frankly I believe that it'll take another 50 years to put that war in perspective. There's so many emotions and feelings around it. <clears throat> what was my role? Um, I have a continuing interest in this as Margaret said I was in Vietnam during 1970 to 71 and have experience firsthand, upfront, and personal. Back then, I was known as Trung Nguy to the Vietnamese I lived with, or LT to my team, teammates. <clears throat> I served as a military advisor to the South Vietnamese. My unit was a five-man team called the Mobile Advisory Team, or abbreviated MAT Team, it consisted of two officers, three NCOs, and an interpreter whenever the interpreter was available. <clears throat> we operated many kilometers away from American bases and lived out in the villages, the small villages and hamlets of Vietnam, <clears throat> usually with a platoon of uh, Vietnamese popular forces or regional forces. <clears throat> we relied on our radio for help if we needed it. Um, in spite of the risks, I felt lucky to be on the team because in Vietnam, things could get much worse. And I felt that we were doing something positive with village hamlet security. <clears throat> uh, this was a time when the morale in the US Army was at a low point. More, uh, this is where more soldiers died after the Tet Offensive than prior. And Tet was a very clear sign that the US plan wasn't working. Every time I look at the wall, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial down in Washington, D.C., I think that half the names wouldn't be there if we had learned the lessons of Tet. In fact, the wall reminds me of a song by Billy Ray Cyrus <clears throat> um, that all gave some and some gave all. <clears throat> so what was the U.S. strategy? Under, Jess, under uh, General Westmoreland, the strategy was search and destroy. This meant locating the enemy and then attacking them with overwhelming military assets, including tactical airplanes, helicopters, gunships, artillery, infantry, and possibly tanks. This was a World War II style approach, which was the prevailing paradigm of senior officers 
who had been successful in World War II, but who were now in command in Vietnam. This, this strategy was in place in spite of the fact that several, the three top Marine generals didn't agree with it. They advocated a different strategy. That strategy involved small unit patrols based in the villages and hamlets and to prevent VC operations, uh, Viet Cong operations, and also to win the trust of the population. That approach was very much like what I was engaged in myself as a mobile advisory team member <clears throat> uh, later in the war in 1970. So after years of search and destroy, Westmoreland's policy from 1965 to 1968, uh, that was 1968 when the Tet Offensive surprised everybody in January. After that, General Abrams became, became head of MACV and supported the Village Hamlet security approach. But even General Abrams faced resistance from a, some of his old school subordinates, major generals usually in, charges, in charge of divisions. Um, but eventually, um, after the debacle of Hamburger Hill in May of 1969, the search and destroy strategy was phased out by the president, the Pentagon, and senior officers. <clears throat> it was just too tragic. And that was where Pres uh, uh, Senator Kennedy, Ted Kennedy, stood up and railed against that policy. Um, but what, in truth, it was very hard to change the paradigms, the mindsets of those senior officers. Uh, it took a while, even after Hamburger Hill. Um, so it's hard to change minds of people who think they're successful and all powerful. But the roots of failure go much deeper than the, the, the generals. There were, I guess what I would call pernicious roots of failure. So behind the dominant muscle flexing of the military leaders and some of the uh, bragging politicians, there was an even more pernicious destructive force. And that was the attitude of our political leaders as called out by Senator Fulbright in his 1966 book, The Arrogance of Power. In a similar fashion, Another author, years later, in 1997, H.R. McMaster, with the benefit of post-war hindsight, uh, wrote a book called Dereliction of Duty. And he concluded that war leaders displayed arrogance, weakness, and lying in the pursuit of self-interest, and above all, the abdication of responsibility to the American people. One example I can give you of this is the story of Marine General David Shoup. He was called in to brief policymakers. Now these are the best and the brightest people, to use a term from David Halberstam. You may have read that book. So he was called in to brief the best and the brightest on the Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961. Should we have an invasion? Should we not have an invasion? So General Shoup comes into the briefing room and he throws up on the wall a map of Cuba. Now, you can imagine sort of a string bean, a half a string bean shape on the wall. Not a potato, a, not a big wide potato, but a little string bean on the wall. And so the best and the brightest say, what's that? General Shoup stands back and says, that is Cuba. And they say, oh, we didn't know. It, um, it's a little uh, larger than we thought. De General Shoup said, yeah, it's, um, if you figure the distance between New York City and Chicago, it's about 800 miles. They go, oh, wow, that's bigger than we thought. So then the next thing General Shoup does is he puts a little dot up on the, up on the wall they probably used those acetate things back then, you know, with the projectors. And uh, he puts a little dot up there, and they said, what's that? What's that little dot? Well, he said, that dot 
is the size of the island of Tarawa. Tarawa took 18,000 Marines in World War II. It took them three days to seize Tarawa. And you want to go into Cuba, which is hundreds of size, hundreds of times larger, you want to go in there with 1,500 uh, patriots. And they thought, oh, so the best and the brightest, after being given that information by General Shoup, decided to go into Cuba. And we, what ensued was the Bay of Pigs invasion and the, the debacle that that was. <clears throat> uh, General Shoup, uh, unfortunately, he was a, a wise Marine. He was a Congressional Medal of Honor winner, and he gave them good advice. Unfortunately, it didn't take. So this typifies the attitude of US leaders right before plunging into the Vietnam War. They were overconfident. They failed to analyze the situation. They were ignorant. They had a sense of superiority, probably justified by a sense of manifest destiny, which came from our European origins of colonialism and, and all of those things. And, and, and indeed, indeed, probably the history of humanity, which, um, which really shows years of conquering, colonizing, and plundering by the superpowers, whether they be Rome or, uh, or the European powers, whatever, if you've uh, done your reading in that area. So speaking, of, uh, speaking to the strategy in Vietnam, there's a little story. <clears throat> um, during 1975, um, in Hanoi, uh, there were some negotiations going on, and a Colonel Harry Summers was talking to an NVA colonel. NVA was the North Vietnamese Army, and they were the ones up north. The Viet Cong were generally the ones down south, <clears throat> although the NVA started migrating down south towards uh, my time in the war. <clears throat> anyway, so Colonel Summers says to the NVA colonel, he says, you never defeated us in battle. And indeed, American troops were mostly prevailed in battle. <clears throat> but in reply, the NVA colonel said, it's irrelevant. Our objective was the gradual wearing down of Americans, not individual battles. So, so what leadership was needed? <clears throat> Sadly, US leaders ignored the lessons of history, even when they were available in writings of Sun Tzu over 2,500 years ago, and others more recently. Um, what we needed were leaders who had the war figured out before they applied military power. Some of these lessons are to use different strategies and tactics only when they apply to a particular set of circumstances. This is nothing other than the basic, basic wisdom of using the right tool for the job or doing the job when the time is right. Using the right approach <clears throat> takes a little bit of thinking ahead of time. <clears throat> Another strategy is to thoroughly understand the capabilities and weaknesses of yourself and the enemy, to fight a short war, to wear the enemy down as the MVA uh, strategy uh, evidenced, um, only attack when strong, influence the supporting population, which was a major strategy of the MVA. Um, most of all, the big, the big overarching strategy is to win without fighting, and if you can't do that, at least minimize the bloodshed. Now in more recent times, specifically the 1950s, the broad concept of total war emerged, and it was espoused by person by the name of Edward Lansdale. Edward Lansdale helped Raymond May Mag Sese, the president of the Philippines, put down the Huck Rebellion uh, in 19, between 1942 and 1954. The idea there was to employ all factors affecting success, including social, political, economic, religious, any other factors beyond and in addition to military power, not just military power. So this, this he said, Lansdale said, that this, inclu this includes understanding the customs and emotions of the population. 
The philo this philosophy was very similar to that of General Giap, who was the Vietnamese general who defeated the French at Dien Bien Phu, and who was the architect of much of the NVA strategy. <clears throat> um, in a post-war analysis of military operations by General Philip Davidson, who was Westmoreland's intelligence chief, Davidson concluded that applying the correct strategy is of critical importance. This is, he wrote a really big, thick book analyzing all the battles in Vietnam. And at the end, he mentioned Sun Tzu. He cited an old Vietnamese, North Vietnamese axiom that says in part, when the tactics are right, but the strategy is wrong, battles may be won, but the war will be lost. That very much echoes Sun Tzu. Um, this very much explains what happened to the US in Vietnam. <clears throat> so getting back to the idea of winning without fighting, uh, what did Sun Tzu say? Well, victorious w warriors win first and then go to war, while defeated warriors go to war first and then seek to win. Also, the supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. In other words, prepare so well that an enemy will not engage you. You may say, but North Vietnam, North Vietnam certainly fought and lost many soldiers and civilians. That is true. Um, on the other hand, they took on the most powerful military in the world and won. So it wasn't without cost. Um, sometimes even the best strategy requires great sacrifice. It's hard to avoid bloodshed if somebody is bent on wiping you out. Uh, with the onslaught of American power, it still took great sacrifice to prevail against all odds. The North Vietnamese strategy used by many of Sun Tzu's dictums, um, used many of Sun Tzu's dictums, and the most powerful one was to defeat the will of the American people. The U.S. vastly underestimated the level of determination and the viability of the North, North Vietnamese strategy. <clears throat> Without that strategy, the North would have suffered a bloody defeat. The point here is that there are, all, there, there are more options than direct conflict, and using enemy weaknesses against them can minimize losses. The idea is to convince the enemy that it is not worth fighting. In the Vietnam War, the most critical point was that America failed in one of Sun Tzu's five critical strategic factors, the way. What is the way? The way means getting the population behind you, getting the people behind you, getting the political power behind you. Certainly, we know from Vietnam that that wasn't the case. We know that with all the protests, the confusion, the disruption about the war, that leaders like LBJ and Nixon were weak on the way. Not only that, they violated another of Sun Tzu's major strategies, leadership, major elements called leadership, which means building trust in the population and in the military. <clears throat> so we had problems with other factors as well, but uh, the way, the cultural aspect, the psych psychological aspect, uh, was severely lacking. In, in Vietnam, the communists applied many of the principles of Sun Tzu, on the other hand, and they used a master strategy to strike at the, and, and, which was to strike at the will of the American people. This led up to the Tet Offensive of 1968 and revealed what has been called the bright shining lie, to quote Neil Sheehan, wrote a book by that title, that we were winning the war. The lie was that we were winning the war. Uh, the Tet Offensive showed that even though that uh, the end was right around the corner, according to our leaders, it wasn't. We were surprised. Um, even though tactically we prevailed in the end, we were shattered. Our military was shattered. Our dis we had widespread disbelief, loss of trust. Um, the North Vietnamese used uh, many of Sun Tzu's principles in building up to the Tet Offensive, deception, flexibility, surprise, fluidity, intelligence, and resolving problems by an indirect approach like guerrilla tactics. 
and surprise. <clears throat> so is this only, does this only apply to Vietnam? No. Um, one example from history, and I don't have time to go into multiple examples, but one example from history comes from uh, an organization called Elevate Society, and they uh, reported on the Cuban Missile Crisis where the United States discovered that the Soviet Union was installing nuclear missiles in Cuba just 90 miles off the coast of Florida. So tensions rose, for those of you who recall that, and the world teetered on the brink of nuclear war. However, instead of resorting to outright warfare, President Kennedy put a naval blockade around Cuba. This was a surprise to the Soviets. Um, it also applied significant pressure on the Soviet Union but did not constitute a direct act of war. So he was coming in from the side on this one. <clears throat> Kennedy's administration then engaged in intense negotiations with the Soviet Union. These were aided by each leader's understanding of the other's political situation and constraints. As a result of these diplomatic efforts, the Soviet Union agreed to remove the missiles from Cuba. In return, the US pledged not to invade Cuba and later agreed to remove its own missiles from Turkey. In this case, the enemy was subdued without a direct military confrontation or fighting, demonstrating the supreme art of war. The Cuban, the Cuban Missile Crisis is an example of how strategic thinking, negotiation, and diplomacy can avert warfare and resolve conflicts, embodying the essence of Sun Tzu's timeless wisdom. So, what about today? Can the lessons from the Vietnam War be applied today? Certainly. First, history tends to repeat itself. Conflict can't be avoided. That's human nature. Good strategic thinking and wisdom will always be useful. In reality, it is our very survival that depends upon strategic thinking and wisdom. Take, for example, the view of John Keegan, notable military historian. <clears throat> In his book, The Face of Battle, he posits that the physical and psychological damage of war and the horror of battle, which we've developed in our, increasingly in our modern age, make the fitness of modern man to sustain the stress of battle incre increasingly doubtful. So if, we, if, we're so if we're facing such stress, what do we do? Well, we're moving toward the kind of battle we prepare for today, which is one step away from nuclear war, nuclear annihilation. So we must learn to win without fighting. <clears throat> now look at all of the conflicts around the world. Israel, Gaza, Ukraine, Africa, Middle East, Taiwan, on and on. <clears throat> How can we reduce conflict and minimize losses? Well, first, we have to get our heads right. We have to avoid our paralyzing paradigms. We must think more deeply. One way is to learn the lessons of the past. But if we get stuck, we must look beyond our habitual, limited ways of thinking and instead look for higher quality solutions. As Robert Piercig said in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, when you are really stuck, when you're really stuck, it's quality, not subjects and objects, objective things that tells you where you ought to go. The solutions are all simple after you arrive at them. They're simple after you arrive at them, but they're simple only when you know what they already are. So we have trouble seeing, we have trouble thinking, stopping, pausing, imagining something different. We must get into the Zen way of caring about the reality we are facing. We must take the time to do that. We must think strategically like Sun Tzu and remember the supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. First, we have to conquer our minds. The lesson for today's leaders, whether in warfare, statecraft, business, or any walk of life is this. You can try to win a conflict simply by attacking and hitting, being aggressive, but you're likely to take a lot of hits in that process. 
and you run the risk of losing. A much better strategy is to know yourself and the enemy. Take the enemy into account and try to maneuver them into a weak position by undermining their strategy. Studying the friendly and enemy cap capabilities, using the art of deception, using the indirect approach, shaping the enemy, employing intelligence gathering activities, and considering all within the context of the economic, political, social, psychological, and environmental situation. Once you have the enemy where you want them, you can then maximize pressure while minimizing the effort needed. The opponent may even be ready to fold without putting up a fight. As Master Sun says, the one who figures on a victory at headquarters before even doing, before even doing battle is the one who has the most strategic factors on his side. The one with many strategic factors in his favor wins. Thank you. And now we're going to have time for a few minutes for a little bit of talk back. That is if you want to talk back. <laughs> and uh, let's see, we have a microphone here for anybody who wants to say something. Uh, you, you've mentioned a number of the wars that are going on. Uh, or the threats that are going on right now. But what I'm interested in is what is your opinion on the way the fighting is going in Israel and the Gaza and in the Ukraine? We're very interested in the Ukraine. We get, we're trying to do whatever we can to help it. But anyway, that's what my, those two. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, we don't, we don't have time for, to write a book, Jamie, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, but I'll tell you, I, I have thought about that. I, I don't think you could escape thinking about that. And I'll just give you a few uh, thoughts, because it goes, you know, there are many layers to this, okay? The first thing would be to step back and think about what we're doing, okay? And consider all the different options we have. So um, that would mean looking at the opposing forces and looking uh, at all of the factors affecting them, the, the kinds I mentioned for total war, you know, the psychological factors, the economic factors, the political factors, the environmental factors, and, and the uh, sentiment and the feelings of the people who are involved in that situation, and also the broader context around them. So it's not just them, it's also all of the other factors affecting them. And um, looking, for way, looking for where there are strengths, and weaknesses, and going through all of that very deliberately, as General uh, Sun said, sitting in headquarters, thinking about that before engaging in military operations, and working through all of that. Um, there are, you know, there are all sorts of options for, for example, instead of using uh, large confrontational military operations, using guerrilla tactics. Um, is, uh, what about winning over the population? Frankly, um, if you can't win, as we used to say in Vietnam, the hearts and minds of the population, you ain't going to win. And um, the other thing is, is the enemy, a, as the Viet Cong did, are they living with the population? And as um, uh, I guess um, one of the Chinese leaders said, um, are they swimming with the are they swimming like fish with the population? Are they living with the population? Are they, are they helping the, you know, the Viet Cong used to go in and help the uh, peasants till the fields, pick the rice. Of course, they also, uh, they, they also exacted taxes too, um, but they tried to keep a balance in, in trying to win over the population. And they looked for the population to, to, uh, to um, protect them and hide them and, um, and uh, not give in to the other side, you might say. So actually, a lot of what I did was involved in counteracting that. We would, do the, we would go in and talk to the population, and we'd uh, do medical things with the population. Um, we'd we'd um, help them wh where we could. Uh, we'd, give them, uh, we'd give them supplies and so forth. And we, we tried to establish a sense of protection in that area. So, I mean, just, that's just one thing. I mean, you could look at uh, pulling back, um, 
And uh, instead of using immediate military forces, there's probably a, a dozen other things you could do. And if we have more time, I actually have a list that I made up of those things, and um, I could share that with you. But that, that you have, we have to think differently. We can't just take the first step as the arrogance, you know, the arrogant first step. We're all powerful. We're the ones with the, with the guns and the tanks and the, the bombs and so forth, and start, and start uh, imposing that on the population. We've got to think about how the whole thing will work, fit together and what will actually work. So that's just a, that's just a teaser for a more in-depth discussion. Okay. <laughs> yes, you're welcome. Yeah. Robert. Thank you so much, first of all, for doing this. But I, when you were talking about how the generals in Vietnam thought that they knew what to do because of World War II, yes. that same problem exists. My son, as you know, was in the military, and now he works for um, a strategic company, and their thing is planning for 50 years out. They're not planning for tomorrow. And trying to persuade Congress that we don't need to have tanks that we don't need to have all this military hardware, because in 50 years, that's not how war is going to be. And it's, it's a huge frustration, because they're all based on what they saw in their movies on TV when they were kids, and that the tanks were the things, and the bombs, and that sort of stuff. And that's really not where the wars are going. The wars are going to be more cyber. And so I don't know how, we, how do we change that. Because every congressional district has something being made in it that goes with the hardware in the military. And nobody wants to say, oh no, we don't need those tanks any longer because that means they might lose jobs in their home district. Yeah. So how do we change that? Yeah, well, first, first one thing that Sun Tzu said is, um, don't let the politicians interfere with the generals. Once, once the politicians hand the war off, the goal off to the military, let the general figure out how to win it. So we, of course, in Vietnam, that was one of the major problems. LBJ was plotting, you know, airstrikes and bombing runs down in the basement of the White House. But, um, and I'm not, I'm not saying that we need to get rid of tanks at all, okay? We need to be strong. We need to actually have muscles. You know, you can't be a good gardener without muscles. If you can't bend down and pick a weed, you're not going to be a very good gardener. But the other thing, though, is to to do, do what your son is engaged in, and that is strategic thinking, and considering all the different possibilities, and building relationships. Um, interestingly, I'm reminded of the picture that was in the press uh, less than a year ago of President Biden going to North Vietnam, and uh, he stood there between the two flags, the North Vietnamese flag and the American flag, at the podium with the leader of Vietnam, and talked about our alliance and our better, improved relationships. That's the kind of thing that needs to happen. We need to build relationships too. In the end, it comes down to emotional factors. You know, the hardware can't stand up to that in the long run. Yeah, you can, you can wipe out a lot of people, but the low, the, an idea won't die. There'll be something that comes up again. And uh, you can't wipe out all your enemy unless you actually win their sentiments, you know. But yeah, all of those things should be thought of now and, and projected in the future. Yeah. Dave, I hear two words, or two ideas which are so important. Number one, building relationships. And number two, being able to think this way. I mean, I, I, I don't know if outside the box is the right way to say it, but certainly, think differently than many people think, or are trained to think. I'm wondering, are we still trying to train military people, I guess, to think this way that, that you're describing? Yeah, I, I, can't sp I can't speak to that exactly, but from what I read in the, in the papers, our military people have become a lot more sophisticated than they were back in the time of Vietnam. And as Robin had mentioned, there's they're starting to think about these kinds of things. I think, I don't think, frankly, I don't, I'm not sure that the military, military people are the problem, unless it's, they're a general and they have an old attitude. Um, I think that it's the overall political system that we have that's the, that is the problem. And, and, and you know, 
a whole other topic is um, whether our system will survive for all the different reasons which imperil it right now. Um, so, and I don't, I don't really want to get into that now, but I've, I've done some reading on that and it's, um, you know, it's pretty scary. Uh, but the key thing is what, uh, what we're fighting is human nature. And we're fighting all of those emotions and things like, you know, for example, fear, which promotes aggression, and just one example, and, uh, and how do we overcome those human nature and get people to think differently? One thing we need to do, though, is free up our political system to uh, look at the, the pillars of society, what makes our society worthwhile and what makes it tick. And um, we need to emphasize those things rather than greed and political careerism, you know, et cetera. So anyway, I'm not sure we have time for any more, but I do appreciate your questions. Oh, one more. I think we need a section with you uh, discuss a discussion. Uh, is that actually working with everybody? It's not working? Oh, I think we need a an, uh, talk, an evening with you, or an afternoon uh, to, to discuss some of these issues. And um, that could be a special uh, I think everybody would be interested because everybody in this in this um, uh, okay. congregation is very smart and very thoughtful. All right. Well, okay. I'll put that under my thinking cap. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Let me go back to Margaret. Or is it? No, no. We, no, it's all right. I still it, have to do something, don't I? No, it's so. just the, um, the the closing music is um, okay. hymn number three hundred and twenty. Verses one, four, five. 